So, uh, in your, I didn't bring my book, I left my book, but uh, in your readings, any uh, questions, comments, discussion topics from what you were reading? Anyone? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think he does a good job in general. Mm -hmm. Nothing uh, confusing or what's that? What did you say, Tiff? Yeah. Okay. I, I told him today, I'm always trying to figure out a question because we never have questions. Uh huh. That's what I need to Because I always keep saying Nimaha. Nimaha? Well, that's Omaha. Yeah. So, um,. I've always heard it pronounced Nehemiah, so. <laughs> but maybe Nemaha, <laughs> Nemaha would work. So, um, so um, uh, again, you know, like we've talked a couple of times, uh, Nehemiah is is not in the history section of the Hebrew Bible; it's in the writings section. Um, with the poetry and the wisdom literature and all those other type of things, also chronicles. Um, but for us, it is it is the um, it is in the historical section. And if you open up to it, uh, it is it's not the last book of the historical section. Esther is, uh, but uh, Esther actually takes place before Nehemiah. So when we talk about the chronology of the Bible, Nehemiah takes us, takes us to the end of Old Testament uh, chronology. So, uh, so that's where, where we will be uh, today. Should have, um, no, nah, I didn't. I should have grabbed a few notes from the intertestamental period and brought them because I expect we'll have a little extra time today. Uh, the title of the book, the English title is Nehemiah. Uh, it, the, the Hebrew title is, is um, you know, kind of changes depending on which, which Hebrew versions you're looking at. But, but, um, but it's, cons it's, it's combined with Ezra. We talked about that when we talked about Ezra. So uh, first and second Esdras are, are what we call Ezra and, uh, and Nehemiah. And we call it Nehemiah after the, the main character, Nehemiah, and probably the author. There is a, dis, you know, there is content, you know, not contention is the wrong word, there's disagreement who actually wrote it. Matter of fact, uh, the, the Jewish uh, tradition, the, you know, the longest Jewish tradition, and many in the Christian realm would say that Ezra was, was the author. Uh, and that uh, Ezra took kind of maybe the personal diary of Nehemiah, because sometimes Nehemiah will talk in the first person. And I did this, and I did that, and that's why a lot of us, myself included, we think Nehemiah wrote it, because he writes in the first person. And then if Nehemiah didn't write it, then you have to account for, well, where did the first person come, how did it come in, into play? And uh, some people would say that Ezra compiled the, the personal diaries of Nehemiah, and just let them stand as, as they were. But most, uh, most conservative uh, uh, expositors and commentators would, uh, would assert that, that Nehemiah wrote the book. Uh, and uh, it's possible maybe that Ezra you know, appended uh, some things to Nehemiah's work, but, uh, but, but probably should assume that, um, that the the author was Nehemiah. Again, like we said before, Nehemiah and Ezra were contemporaries. Nehemiah, I'm sorry, Ezra probably older than Nehemiah, I'm assuming. I don't know that we know the, the ages of either one of them, but we do know that, uh, that Ezra was 12 years earlier in, uh, in getting to the, to the, uh, back to Jerusalem than Nehemiah was. And so I tend to, tend to s suppose that Ezra was the elder um, of, of the two. Uh, and the time frame we're looking at is, you know, kind of, uh, you know, s 
I don't somewhere around 433 to 420 BC is kind of the uh, the uh, the general time frame uh, of Nehemiah uh, and uh, what's what's happening. So uh, let's review again important in the context of of what we of of the post-exilic books, the context of the return. Remember, remember that there are, there are three returns, and later when we start studying uh, Jeremiah and Daniel and some of the other ones, we're going to kind of be focusing on the three deportations of, the, of, the, uh, of Judah to Babylon. And so don't confuse that with the three different returns that we have recorded. And it's unfortunate that we're doing it this way because we're talking about the returns, which happen after the deportations. Um, and so, you know, maybe just a, a quick, quick timeline. Uh, you know, King David, um, and then we go through, you know, Solomon to the divided kingdom. Again, the northern kingdom going up in, into captivity. Israel, it's called, 722. The southern kingdom going, finally going off into captivity in 586, but there were actually three different points at which Babylon had come in and done some level of destruction and some level of deportation. 586 is when they came in and did the final one. They destroyed the temple um, and all that type of stuff. So we look at that as the final one, but there were actually two two preliminary ones that took place, taking most, not all, of, these, of the uh, Judeans to Babylon. And then Babylon loses power to Persia. Actually, it was kind of a combined Med, Med, Medes and Persians, a Medo-Persian reign. And while they're, as soon as these guys take over, then we, then we have three different marked returns of Israelis, Judeans, back to Jerusalem. So these are the, the three deportations, which we haven't talked about yet because they're not necessarily germane to where we are. But these three we have talked about, and it's important that we, that we remember those. The first one, and the each, there's a main name combined with each one. The first one was Zerubbabel. Okay, and Zerubbabel uh, returned in 538. So this first one was 538. And it was Zerubbabel. And he brought the first group back. They started to rebuild the temple. And then it got stopped. And that's when Haggai and others are writing, writing their books. Um, but they eventually finished the temple in 515. Finished rebuilding the temple in 515. All these dates are, are B.C. Uh, then the second return was Ezra. And, and matter of fact, there's, if we we're going to do them kind of chronologically, it looks more like this. So there's a bigger gap here than there, than there was between Ezra and Nehemiah. And, uh, and Ezra will come back in 458. Oops. Didn't write that very well. You probably can't read it anyways. 458. Uh, and there will be the renewing of the covenant. The temple's in place. They're, 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 they're reinstituting uh, you know, the covenant, uh, things going on in the, in the temple. And then the third one will be Nehemiah in 445 is when he comes back the first time. He'll actually make, he'll come back twice. But, uh, but 445, and so those are the three returns. And so uh, you kinda, it's, it's, a, you know, it's good to remember the names, Rebbebel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. Those are the three key fi fi figures, and they go chronolo chronologically, those three guys, and kind of the main thing that they did. You know, Zerubbabel rebuilding the temple, Ezra reinstituting kind of, you know, I say the covenant, but, but what you, you need to kind of reinstituting faithfulness to the covenant. Of, of, of the Israelites. This is what God has called us to do and we need to do these things. And then Nehemiah, as we'll talk about today, 
the um, uh, the rebuilding of of uh, of the walls, kind of the uh, setting up Israel. Um, Israel, for lack of a better term, the security. Uh, one other thing before we get into Nehemiah in general is uh, during, uh, during the time of, of Nehemiah, uh, well, well, go to, go to, to, to Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, and we'll talk about this now, maybe we'll talk about it when we do Daniel. But uh, Daniel is, is, is gone by now. He's, he's, he's died in Babylon in exile somewhere. Um, but uh, Daniel chapter 9, there's a, in, in much of Daniel is, is prophetic, looking into the future, sometimes the near future, sometimes the very, very far future. But Daniel chapter 9 in the section we're looking at is he's looking into the, to the near future, well, primarily near future, I guess. Uh, verse 20, Now I, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God on behalf of the holy mountain of my God. Let me just stop there and remind you that all of this is taking place chronologically, you know, way back here, all right? So... So again, he's, this is, this is gonna, he's talking in the past and he's going to talk about things that are going to happen in the future. While I was still speaking in my prayer, I'm in verse 21, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision, previously came to me in my extreme weariness about the time of the evening offering. And he gave me instructions and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, the command was issued that I come and tell you, for you are highly esteemed, so give heed to the message and gain understanding of the vision. Here's the vision. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy place. That's kind of an overarching idea of, he kind of gives the big picture and then he'll go back and he'll explain the pieces. So he says, 70 weeks have been decreed. What, what we'll see, you know, what we, what we need to know is, becomes obvious as we get to the end of this, is that, is that 70 weeks were, were 70 weeks of years. Uh, 70, times, 70 times seven is what? 490. And so he's, he's referring to 490 years, uh, not, not 70 weeks of days, which would be our initial assumption, but it becomes obvious that he's referring to 70 weeks of years. So now he talks more in detail. So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, 69 weeks of years, seven weeks and two weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in the times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, there's seven and then 62 more. Can't figure out why the break. I mean, in case you're wondering, well, why doesn't he just say 69? That I do not have an idea. As a matter of fact, I've never read a good understanding of that. Um, but there's, I've read understandings of it, but none that have been convincing. But, but we know that he is referring to 7 and 62 is 69. So initial 7 and a follow-on 62. So after the 62 weeks, verse 26, then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing and the prince of the people who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war, desolations, and, a and wars and desolations are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice. I mean, that he is the prince who is to come, the Antichrist is what the reference is to. Put a stop to sacrifice, grain offering, and the Wings of abomination will come, one who makes desolate. If you remember in the New Testament, Jesus talked about the, 
uh, abomination of desolation in the temple. Um, and that's an intertestamental thing. And maybe if we have time later today, we can talk a little bit about it. Even until a complete destruction, one that is poured out on the one who makes desolate. And so this particular 70 weeks, it's, it's interesting because what it says is that from the time the, the, the decree to rebuild is issued, there's going to be 69 weeks until the Messiah, and then he's going to be cut off. And then it starts talking about this last week where there was an abomination and desolation. And, and, and as, you, as, as you work out, and so, uh, well, as, uh, well let, let me, I'm trying to figure out which way to, which, what, to put, what to put first here. That decree takes place in the book of Nehemiah. All right, um, that, uh, that decree is uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, and you don't need to bother turning there now, but when Nehemiah chapter 2 talks about one of the decrees, there, there were actually multiple decrees. As you read um, Ezra and Nehemiah, there were multiple decrees. There was the original decree, return, Jews, and I forget who it was, Cyrus, decreed that. And then there was a decree to rebuild the temple and then stop and then redo it again. All right. And, and, and so there was a number of them. So the question is always, well, you know, trying to figure out which, which decree Daniel is, is referring to. Uh, but that decree is the one that, that, uh, that Nehemiah lists in chapter 2. Uh, and it was in 444 B.C. And and I'm, I won't do this now. Maybe we'll do it when we study Daniel. But when you take the, the date of that decree and, and when, it actually, when it actually took place, and you add into it this, well, 69 weeks of years. 69 times 7 is what? 483. 483 years from this point, actually to the day, takes you to the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And, and, it's, and, and in order to do that, well, there's, there's, other, there's, there's, some, there's some things you have to do with changing from lunar years to solar years, and there is no year zero. I mean, this is a B.C. year. There is no year. So you've you, you know, you got, you, you got to adjust a few things because because we mark time differently than they mark time. But the point is, once you, once you make all those adjustments, you get to the uh, triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem, at which point, you know, he basically declares himself, presents himself better as the king, and he, instead of being accepted as the king, he's crucified, you know, and... And Daniel talks about he'll be cut off. Um, I suppose the Jewish leaders understood Daniel, yeah, and, and should have had their eyes wide open at that point in time. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I guess I should they have. You could argue they should have, but they had their eyes closed to so much even more obvious things. Well, you know, who has opened the eyes of the blind since well, the beginning of time? We've never heard of, you know, just like, yeah. Yeah, I think I think I think their their eyes were so shut that they they didn't even get the big things, let alone the, you know the these these type of things. But um, and so he's cut off, and and again, this is getting more into eschatology, which 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 you know isn't the isn't the subject of our of our course. But you get to the point of the cross, which is where the Messiah is cut off. And then they go, and this is the 69 weeks take us to there. And then we have the one other week, and from previous chapters of Daniel, um, and, and you know, we know that, that that one week brings in, this is 69, so here's one week of years, seven years, at the conclusion of that is the end. Okay, that's the end. And so, so that hasn't happened yet. And what, what we have between the 69th week and the 70th week is this 
huge gap. It's, it's, it's actually the gap that we live in. We, we live in this, and the Bible uses all kinds of terms for the gap, the times of the Gentiles, um, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Um, and so there's, there's lots of terms that the Bible uses for this gap and things that will take place in this gap uh, until, until we, you know, we, we, we get to this final week where you know, he, the, the, the prince that is to come, he says in Daniel 9, 26, the prince is, in, is to come, he'll make wars, he'll make desolations, he'll make a treaty, in the middle of it he'll break a treaty, and, and so we have all of these things that it talks about here in Daniel and, and in a, a number of other different places. It, it just fits hand in glove with a number of other things in the scripture. And at the end of that, the Messiah will return to destroy the Antichrist. And, and we go into the, you know, the millennial kingdom. All right? And so what, what we know is this seventh week hasn't happened yet. Because Daniel makes it very clear that the seventh week is, is, is the culmination of, of these things, um, and the 69th week has. So we're somewhere in the gap. And, and, and so all of that is, is, is a factor, but the big point I wanted to, to make known, and then I'll, 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 add, I'll come right to you, Samantha. The big thing I wanted to make known is that this date is a date that occurs in the book of Nehemiah. All right, and so Nehemiah marks that, that date. Right. So is their math basically ignoring this gap that we're in right now? Yeah, they, 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 post-millennialists and amillennialists would both, would both say there, there is no gap. They would say that this 69th week was actually, when was the destruction of 70 AD? 70 AD. Yeah, the, you know, the destruction of Jerusalem and the Solomon's temple by the Romans um, in, in 70 AD, and that we are now, the post-millennialists would say that, the, let me see, the post-millennialists would say that, that we're, we're, in, we're in the millennium getting better and better and better. The amillennialists would say there really isn't a millennium. It's, it's a heavenly, it's a spiritual millennium, so don't look for it on the earth. Um, and, but, but the amillennialists would also say that that like the, the events of the book of Revelation, which talks almost solely about this, well, this week, this seventh day of the week, they would, there's a term called preterist. They, they, and amillennialists are, if you ever hear the word preterist, it means those who believe that all of the things in the book of Revelation are not in the end. We would, I would be a futurist. Most of the things are still future. They're preterist that they believe that the things have already taken place. And so it's, it's, it's over with. And so all that's a great, great study in lots of different ways. That it, it doesn't, in every other passage in Daniel, because Daniel talks about these epochs, and then he talks about this final godless epoch, number of different ways, the, the, the wicked horn that is just above and beyond all other horns. And, and every time Daniel talks about this particular epoch, at the end of it, you know, like in, in, the, uh, in the original, uh, in the original uh, statue of bronze, at the end of it, the Messiah comes and destroys the kingdoms of the world and sets up his kingdom. And, and the, the amillennialists, you just can't see that. It, I mean, when, 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 uh, when Rome, or I'm sorry, when Rome destroyed Jerusalem, um, it, the pagans were still in charge, and they have been. They still are, still are to this day. So, yeah, I mean, I don't want to talk so disparagingly of them that, that they ignore them, but I, but, um, but the, it doesn't, it, it, I mean, Daniel just seems to be too clear that after this week, the world is fixed. It's not still broken. Um, and we clearly are not in the fixed world at, at this particular point why we have you know, one-year-old children you know, dying. Um, even the millennium says that the person who lives to be a, 
what, 500 years old will be thought a child, you know, so. Um, so um, it's an important kind of concept and it's, Nehemiah is not um, a prophetic book, but, uh, but he marks this, this date for us. And, uh, and again, to, to do the numbers and the math on, on those 483 years to the, to the triumphal entry of Christ is, is, just, is just amazing. Um, and, uh, and maybe again, when we do Daniel, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, take, a little, we'll take a look at, uh, at some of that. So that's kind of all, in a sense, on, on a side. Um, so when you look at, at the timeline of the book of Nehemiah, now this, this isn't the outline. Matter of fact, I, I gave you an outline in that little handout that, that you have. And maybe you should just put this on, on the outline somewhere. But chronologically... Chapters 1 through 12 uh, talk about the first return of, of, um, of Nehemiah in about 446. And he's there for about 11 years. Okay, So the first return of Nehemiah, which takes about 11 years time frame, takes us from, from chapter 1 through... Uh, through chapter 12. Uh, chapter 13, and it kind of is in there and out real fast, so it's easy to miss. In chapter 13, Nehemiah, because he stays there 11 years, and then he, he goes back, and he is somewhere around, it seems like, 11 years back in Persia, and then he comes back again for a second governorship. All right. Uh, and so, um, although thematically, your outline shows, shows a, a really clear distinction thematically between the first seven chapters and the last, what is that, six, chapter eight being a very important thematic break, chronologically, one through 11, actually one through 12, have him during the first period, and chapter 13, there's a break. He goes back to Susha. Susa, Susha. I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Um, and, then, and then returns. So let me, uh, let me put this up here. Um, this is the, the Persian Empire. Um, and it gives you kind of some old, you know, the Assyrian Empire kind of focused out of here with you know, Nineveh being very important for the Assyrian Empire, and we've talked about that in the book of Jonah, Sunday evenings. Uh, the Babylonian uh, Empire, Babylon, kind of the, the, key, the key place, uh, and that's key in the book of Daniel and, and, and other places. Uh, the Persian Empire, uh, and here we're going to talk about Susa, kind of the head or the capital of the Persian Empire. That's where the book of Esther takes place, right? Uh, and that's uh, um, uh, where, um, uh, where uh, uh, Nehemiah um, was, was probably the cupbearer uh, at that particular point. So, um, So the characters in the book of Nehemiah, who are the players, per se? Uh, Nehemiah, obviously important. Uh, a little uh, short bio on Nehemiah. A cupbearer to Art Artaxerxes I. A cupbearer seems like a pretty trivial, pretty trivial task to be assigned, but I think we all, you all understand that it's not a trivial task at all. It's actually a, a very high position, or at least a very trusted position. Cupbearer's job was to do what? Anybody know? Make sure the wine wasn't poisoned. Sure poison. um, you know, and so he is, he is the, um, he is the guy who the king trusts. Um, yeah, you remember in the book of uh, in the book of uh, uh, whatever uh, Moses, not Moses, not the book of Moses, the book of Genesis. The baker during the time of Joseph, and the bread baker and the who else? 
Somebody else. <laughs> no, the butler did it. No, that's a game. That's a game. Huh? The, I think it was the cupbearer and the baker. Both end up in prison because there was a life on the king, and he, he's figuring one of these two guys. Poisoning was, a, was the easiest way to knock off the king. You know, coup, but if you do a coup, you're kind of left with blood on your hand. If the just, king just all of a sudden falls over and dies, then... Um, then he, he was kind of, I, 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 suspect, I suspect it was his job to, to either watch as it's prepared or, if there's any doubt, to, to risk his own life. I mean, I, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know all the details. I'm not sure we, we, we know, but he was, he was responsible um, uh, for that. And a trusted man. Uh, and, when, and all of that, you know, you, you've becomes even more, um, even more crazy when when you know Nehemiah is sitting there before the king, and he's and the king says, Nehemiah, you're sullen. You know, why why are you so sullen? And and he'll even tell us in the text. And and Nehemiah says, and he says, I was greatly afraid, because you know kings are reading the best guy to have as your cupbearer is somebody who you can you can read his emotions like a book. You know, a guy who's a terrible poker player is the guy you want in these type of things, and you can tell that something's up and so you know in situations like that yeah and and then to make matters worse i mean and then he asked the king oh and by the way do you think i might be able to have a leave of absence for a while so so you know to think that whether this was the plot or there was a plot a brewing for the king um, it doesn't mean that this particular cup but you know they you know there he could have been thinking you know He's going to think there's a, pl there's a plot brewing against him. I'm asking to leave town. Um, you know, everything is against us on this. Uh, and, um, and so he, he will fire up a quick prayer to the Lord. Um, and and so, so that's just a lot of interesting things about there. Um, uh, he, that is Nehemiah, ensured the king was not poisoned by drink. He would be known personally by the king and probably even a trusted advisor. Nehemiah served two terms as governor of Judea. Now, the governor of Judea was not, elect, was not an elected official by the Judeans. Okay, the governor of Judea, where did he come from? From which, which, which king? King of Persia. King of Persia. He, was an appointed, he was appointed by the king of Persia. So remember, from, from this particular point until... 19, was it 48? 48? From this particular point till 1948, Israel is an occupied country. Un, with just a tiny, tiny, tiny broken bit during the Maccabean period in the intertestamental period where they have a little bit of freedom for a short period of time between the Greeks and the Romans. But it's short-lived. So from here until here, there's always a foreign power telling, the, telling people who's ruling in Jerusalem, okay, or in, in Judea. So there, and, and, and this is, is that time frame, or, or this, this, this epoch too, when, when the, the times of the Gentiles that, that are going to trample in Jerusalem. It's not going to belong to the, to the Jewish people. It's got a little bit off the trail, but so Israel is called Israel today, but Judah was the surviving nation. Yeah, yeah. The idea of why, how that well, Judah was, Judah, was, Judah was the tribe. And even though we read about in the, in the Chronicles and Kings, we read about the king of Judah, um, you know, it's, it, it really was just a distinguishing the king of the tribe of Judah versus the king of the other tribes, <laughs> Israel. You know, so they kind of kept the the primary name, it's the, the naming almost looked as if, as if Judah was, was the, for lack of a better term, the rebel. And, and it wasn't just Judah, it was Judah and Benjamin. But, but that was the, that was the, the Davidic dynasty. And, um, and so, uh, and, and even in Chronicles and Nehemiah, the name goes back and forth. Um, and some of the prophets will refer to the whole country uh, as Israel, even after um, even after Israel is gone, like Ezekiel, 
he'll, he'll refer to the entire nation. And the only thing left is the southern kingdom of Judah. They'll, he'll refer to them as Israel. And so, um, so the, the, it, Israel is kind of the, the long bit. And, and our reading last week did a good job of explaining that, that there were remnants from all the tribes who, who were in, uh, in the southern kingdom. And, and clearly, by the time we get back here to the restoring of the kingdom, remnants from, from all of them. Another main character, uh, Ezra. Um, and the same notes that we talked about last time, the most famous Jewish scribe and teacher led the second return of the exiles in 458, spearheaded the reform of the Jewish nation after the exile. Two guys that come up, two bad guys, Sanballat, governor of Samaria, right, who tried to stop the building of the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, don't have it. Don't have it here. This is probably going to get us. This will get us close. You know from New Testament times where Samaria is. Here's, here's Jerusalem. These are the, the tribes of, of, of Israel. Here's Jerusalem. When the country divided, it divided you know, somewhat right along these, you know, kind of like that. Benjamin and Judah stay down here. Everybody else goes with the north. Um, and, and then um, when we get to the New Testament times, this... This middle piece right here is called Samaria, right? And, and it's already getting that name you know, way, you know, way back in this particular time. And, and remember, this went off into captivity first with the Assyrians. From here forward, the Assyrians took them off. And they not only took out the Israelites, but they repopulated it with conquered peoples from other nations. Um, and there's a whole history there, which, which, we, which, we, won't, which we won't get into. Um, and, uh, and so now the restoration is the restoration of, of the people who had been living here primarily, taken off into exile, and now they're, they're coming back. So basically what happens is you end up with some, some political boundaries that kind of get formed over the years, uh, and including the intertestamental period, that kind of stay put even as we get to the New Testament, because in the New Testament, Israel, the nation, what the historic landmass, is kind of broken up into three different territories. You have Galilee, which is this area up here, Samaria, this area right here, and Judah or Judea, which is the area down here. And so these divisions, different than the tribal divisions in the beginning, you know, are all forming and taking place and and so Sanballat, um, you know, Nehemiah is going to end up being the governor of, uh, of uh, I'm not sure how far it went, but certainly in Jerusalem. But, but uh, was it Sanballat or, or the other guy? I can't remember. Um, uh, yeah, Sanballat would be the, will be the governor of, of, uh, of, of Samaria. And so region nearby, um, but, but not, not the same. Tobiah, an Ammonite official who also tried to stop the building of the walls. And the Ammonites, if I'm not mistaken, I, oh, there they are. Yeah, they're good. They're on this map. Ammonites, you know, kind of different region, but, but off, to the, off to the side. Remember they had, they had opposition to rebuilding the temple under Zerubbabel? And they've, so they, they continue to get op, uh, opposition So two biggest things that happen in the book of Nehemiah, and some of it you're familiar with. One is the rebuilding of the walls, and then that's the, kind of the first half, the wall of Jerusalem, and the second half are the kind of the reforms um, of, uh, of the nation. I put a little map in your notes uh, that, uh, did I ask, I, I think I did ask, nobody's been in Israel, right, except Brad, Brad had, Brad had been there. Um, it, it, the map is so much more meaningful if, if you can, you know, envision it. Um, but um, you can see in that map, and, and this, is a, this is more of a, of a map from the Roman period. 
uh, and, and so, uh, um, uh, it, at least when you look at the temple, the temple mount wasn't that big um, uh, during the um, during the uh, uh, this particular period. But where you see that temple, that's Mount Moriah. Uh, and if you go off to the right, you you d you dump into the uh, uh, what's the what's the the, oh, there it is, the Kidron Valley. Okay, the Kidron Valley. If you if you go, if you went off to the right of where it says Temple Mount, you would drop down into the Kid, Kidron Valley, and then you would rise up on the Mount of Olives. And it's not a big. I mean, it, it, when you get there, you I mean, it's, I mean it, you're gonna you're gonna lose your breath walking down one side and up the other. But but it isn't gonna take you but 20 minutes to do so. So so you can kind of envision. Um, how, how big it is. But that finger that goes way down there, uh, and you see the city of David down there, uh, that, that uh, you know, you have a valley on both sides, and so it's kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a topographical finger, which means high ground, um, kind of going down. Uh, and that's where there's a lot of excavation right now going on uh, for the, uh, uh, you know, for the city of David. But the walls, the part that's germane to us is the wall that was built, um, the defensive wall, like you would envision, you know, like, you know, western forts had, had wood walls to keep the, keep the, uh, the, uh, the, the attackers out, and ancient walls were built of, of this one was of stone, and so uh, you can see the tracing of the outline um, of the wall. I don't think, is there a scale of, oh, there's a scale of feet there on the bottom. So it gives you an idea, what are we looking at? Um, probably from the southernmost point to the northernmost point, uh, we're looking at uh, 3,000 feet. So what is that? Less than three quarters of a mile, two thirds, two thirds of a mile, maybe more or less. So it um, gives you just a, an, an idea of the, of the size. And that's the wall that they were that they were rebuilding. Just the Tower of the Hundred. Tower of... Where are you? At the very top. Very top. Tower of the Hundred. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, they, and, and maybe, maybe that'll come up. Uh, you know, there's lots of names of the gates and the towers and stuff, and, uh, and I haven't committed them to... Um, but I, I would be willing to bet that, um, that, that those, I'm, I'm probably assuming they incorporated them into this map because they're reflected in the reading of Nehemiah. I just don't, don't remember, you know, but um, so um, anything about that that you need to, that you need to think about? Uh, you know, you should notice where the East Gate is. You know, that's always been an important, important um, piece there. Uh, so the theme of the book of, G of Nehemiah, kind of the general theme of the book, I think I have this in your, your notes, the final phase of the return, that's important, final phase of the return from captivity is refortifying the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah oversees this work. The walls are rebuilt in spite of local opposition. The covenant with God is renewed again and again and again and again. At the same time, the hand of God is clearly at work in these events, and the leadership of Nehemiah is clearly evident. Um, relationship to other books, Nehemiah brings to a close the returning of God's people to the promised land. The temple is rebuilt, the city of Jerusalem is restored, the nation is given another chance, but the extensive preaching of the prophets on the coming Messiah and Messianic reign has slowly shifted from the focus from living in a land of milk and honey to a coming relief of foreign oppression by God. Let me, let me read you that again. I should have given it to you. I should have put it in your notes. Did I put it in your notes? No, I didn't. I should have. Because I, I think this, is, this, this helps us understand when we start reading in the New Testament about the messianic fervor that existed and what they were looking for in the Messiah. Because that 
begins to change. And, and it begins to change because of the, you know, the, the teaching of the, of the prophets. Um, but let me read it one more time. Nehemiah brings to a close the returning of God's people to the promised land. The temple is rebuilt. The city of Jerusalem is restored. The nation is given another chance. But the extensive preaching of the prophets on the coming Messiah and Messianic reign has slowly shifted from slowly shifted the focus from living in a land of milk and honey to a coming relief of foreign oppression. Okay? And again, when we get to the time of Christ, the big foreign oppression was who? The Romans. You know, are you going to throw the Romans out? Are you going to you're going to restore the kingdom? Are you going to get us out from underneath this foreign oppression with other people telling us how to live and, 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 and dictating, um, dictating what, uh, what we are to do? So, um, so, you know, that's kind of where we go from Nehemiah into the intertestamental period to the, to the New Testament. Uh, last comment on the relationship of Nehemiah to other books. Um, the last book of your Bible is Malachi. Um, and Malachi was probably a contemporary with Nehemiah. All right, he probably there the, the same time. So when you when you read Nehemiah, or you you know you should be also thinking Malachi. Uh, questions, comments, discussion on anything so far. Let me do something before I forget, because I will forget if I don't do it now. Some of you walked in late. Ann, can I borrow your? pen for one more second just so I can make sure I keep this okay let me see Trevor and Paige walked in and Samantha and Chase did okay all right just so I don't forget I think that was it right no Michael too I didn't even notice you Michael you're kind of sly Thanks, Ann. Hey, Pastor. Yeah. The Tower of the Hundred was kind of plateau on the north side. It's the easiest place to live. Oh, is that, uh huh? Is it, um, is it listed in the text of Nehemiah, I suspect? It's a note. A note. It's a note. It's, I think it is. Yeah, the Tower of the Hundred is a tree. Where, um, if I re- uh, where the Tower of Hundred is on that, um, the fortress of Antonia in the New Testament times. Is the same place and still existing um, portions of the fortress of uh, An- Antonio, Antonian. That's where the Roman guards would have been stationed um, during the time of Christ. The, the Roman guards who had came out and arrested Paul later when they said he was in the temple with the Greek. That would have all taken place in that north, was that northwest, northwest corner. You can still, you can still walk by it. Matter of fact, um, this is a side note, and I guess you're the first one to know this. Uh, Steve Stevenson uh, just told me a little while ago, for those of you who don't know Steve, he's a longtime uh, member and, and elder here who went with the uh, church plant down in Baser and has continued to be an elder and a member down there. He's, he's, um, but uh, Steve told me that uh, they are heading to Israel with a group with somebody that, that they know um, in June, and there are spots if anybody wants to wants to go with them it's a tour typical typical tour of of jerusalem and israel um and he, and i think it's june 12th for 10 days um the cost on the ground after you fly there that covers pretty much everything except anything you might want to buy is like three thousand dollars so if you're in what's that israel i can't remember when i went um <laughs> Yeah, I don't, don't, yeah, don't, don't remember. I don't, I don't think it is. I don't, I don't think it's quite that bad. But if you're interested, you've never been, it is, um, uh, it is, it is a helpful thing to, to understand uh, the events of, of the Scripture. Uh, any other questions, comments? Okay, so let's go through the uh, chapters uh, pretty quick. I'll just read them for you again. And we'll dialogue on any of the ones that, um, that we need to. Uh, just kind of the opening notes on Nehemiah. Nehemiah, a contemporary of Ezra, 
continues the history of Israel. Whereas Ezra recounts the rebuilding of the temple and spiritual restoration of the people, Nehemiah will focus on the rebuilding of Jerusalem, specifically its wall of defense. And again, those are generalities because there's also spiritual restoration of the people that takes up a lot of the last half of the book. Uh, chapter 1. Um, the book opens with, a, with brief information about Nehemiah. A report comes to Nehemiah, who is in the Persian court at Susa, that Jerusalem and its people are downtrodden. Nehemiah is broken by these words and offers a model prayer of national repentance. Nehemiah describes the events in which the king of Persia prodded him as to his sullen appearance. This is chapter 2. And he requests a leave of absence from his duties in the court. He also requests assistance from the king for safe passage and building supplies, all of which he receives, again the hand of God. Nehemiah leaves for Jerusalem and en route reports to the local governors. He's immediately opposed by two anti-Israeli local leaders. He goes to Jerusalem and does a secret reconnaissance of the state of the walls. He then calls the Jews to rebuild the wall and they set to work. Shortly thereafter, the work is openly opposed by three local rulers. Uh, interesting thing, we talked, I think it was last week, about the fact that Ezra, when he, had, when he told the king he was going to go, and the king said, yeah, go, and by the way, offer prayers for me. Ezra said, you know, I don't want to ask the king for guards. Um, Nehemiah does. Um, and so, um, so, just so we don't, you know, you know, what's the difference? I don't know. I guess when you, when you walk close with, the, uh, with the, the Spirit of the Lord, you know when you're being prudent and you know when you're being unfaithful. And, um, but, and there are times for both. Uh, chapter 3. A detailed description of the household restoring different sections of the wall is given. It's actually a kind of a boring chapter. Um, and it's so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did that portion of the wall, and so-and-so did this portion of the wall. Kind of like the genealogies, you know. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, um, uh, chapter 4, Sanballat steps up his campaign to discourage the work. So Nehemiah prays that God will curse him. Anybody know what those things are called when you pray that God will curse somebody? They're kind of an, an imprecatory prayer, yeah. And the Psalms, we have imprecatory Psalms. and uh, hard, to kind of, hard to kind of figure out how to deal with those. But, but we see it. When the wall is half finished... Those in opposition devise a plan. So there's some funny things in the book of Nehemiah too. I think it's probably in chapter 4 where the guys say, that wall isn't going to do anything. Matter of fact, if a fox jumps on it, it's going to fall over. Remember, it wasn't just putting blocks up. It's supposed to, be a, a, it's supposed to repel an invader. Um, and um, so uh, a lot of uh, interesting comments like that. When the wall is half finished, those in opposition dev devise a plan to halt the work through warfare. Fear begins to grip many Israelis, but Nehemiah refuses to give way, and God thwarts the plan. With the immediate threat of attack abated, the remainder of the work was done with the men girded for warfare. He talks about they wore their sword um, uh, by day, and their sword in one hand, their trowel in the other. Matter of fact, I think that was, uh, for those of you who are familiar with um, Spurgeon, the sword and the trowel, I think that was the, where he took the title for that. Um, um, from this particular portion of Nehemiah. Uh, chapter 5, Nehemiah confronts an economic crisis in the community brought on because of disobedience to the Mosaic laws of usury and ownership. Usury means what? Loan interest. Okay. Uh, he calls a great council to fix the situation, confronts the perpetrators, who promised to do to who promised to right the wrong to fix it? Nehemiah is appointed to be the governor, and he serves pro bono. Pro bono means free of charge. Free of charge. Yeah, it's a term that professionals. It's not it's usually not it's a term that's restricted typically to to professionals who, who conduct their professional act without any charge. 
all, of, all the while continuing his part in the work on the wall. Uh, chapter 6, with the wall almost done, the enemies of Israel try unsuccessfully to lead Nehemiah into a trap. Next, they attempt to accuse him of rebellion. Finally, they try to scare him into defiling the temple. They said, you better run there and hide because people are trying to kill you. Nehemiah is not tricked. Ultimately, the wall is finished and the God of Israel is glorified in what was, what was you know, accomplished. And it, interesting, and just in general through the book of Nehemiah, you have this guy who's just this amazing leader, Nehemiah. And he motivates these people to do this impossible task, all the while under, uh, under threat of attack and everything else. He's, you know, but, um, um, and, and we should recognize you know, those traits of Nehemiah but, but the book makes it very clear that, that the success of Nehemiah was because of the providence of God. You know, that God was the one who, who did these things. He moved the king's heart. You know, he thwarted this plan. He, he brings about the building of the wall. And so, so you know, it's, it's not meant to be a, you know, this is, this is, this is a book on, on, on leadership, right? You know, and people who want to teach Nehemiah as a book on leadership, you know, you might find a principle or two, but you're missing, you're missing the main points of the book. Chapter 7, guards are set up at the gate for protection of the city. The genealogies of the tribes are updated with special note given to the Levites. Priests that could not validate their genealogy were excluded from service in the temple, I mean, from service in the temple until the will of God could be determined through the Urim and Thummim. Uh, chapter 8, uh, and here's a kind of a, a shift. Under the leadership of Ezra, the people are taught the laws of God. You know, they were greatly broken by their ignorance to and disobedience of the law. But Ezra and Nehemiah directed them to a time of praise. The Feast of Booths is reinstituted. Feast of Booths, anybody remember, when, when did that come into play? We've already talked about that. Feast of Booths came into play after the... After the Exodus, okay, after the Exodus, and it was to remind them of the time they spent wandering in tents um, um, in those 40 years. So they would actually live in booths, and still do. Tents. We say booths, they, they, they basically they live in tents. Mm, chapter 9. In a continued state of repentance, the people confess their sin and mourn over their unfaithfulness. The Levites then lead in a prayer of praise to God, which recounts his faithfulness over the years. Really important at this particular juncture, because we're about to close Old Testament history. From creation to the Exodus. The prayer continues, highlighting the constant waywardness of the people, even in light of God's steadfast faithfulness. It ends with a plea to God to help them out of their current state of being subjugated to the kings of the world. We talked about that a couple of times. And it will, it will go on and on and on. Anybody, this is extra credit. Um, what New Testament preacher preached the same message and where was he? This is for extra credit. That, and by the same message, I mean highlighting the constant waywardness of the people, even in light of God's steadfast faithful. Yeah, good, very good. Stephen and Acts, very good. The prayer, chapter 10. The prayer of chapter 9 was put in writing and signed by many of the leading men. Two specific areas of repentance are given next. Foreign marriages and breaking the Sabbath. Um, interesting, how many of you would put those two things in the same category? Foreign marriages and breaking of the Sabbath. Probably not, 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 uh, not many of us. The, the emphasis that, uh, that Nehemiah places um, on the Sabbath or that the scripture places on the Sabbath in the book of Nehemiah is, is really quite amazing. Okay, here's another free. Um, well, I don't know if I can, if I can, if I can even think. But um, how many of you read J.C. Ryle? You read anything from Ryle? Uh, Ryle was when? 18, or no, before that, before the 18s. 16, 16, 17, what's that? Was he 1800s, J.C. Ryle? It wasn't before that? Okay. Um, 
nonetheless, when you read Ryle, read his book on holiness, it's classic. Um, and, uh, and Ryle sounds a lot like Nehemiah. Uh, in that as Ryle talks about the desecration and the wickedness. Now, Ryle is, is, is speaking as a Christian in, in, you know, just a couple hundred years ago. Talks about the desecration in, of, of, uh, of, of, of the people and the immorality and the, all of these type of things. Uh, in, in, at least in that particular work, the pursuit of holiness, he always, as this, he, I don't know about always, he routinely includes in the list of atrocious sins desecrating the Sabbath. Inter I mean, it took me by surprise as I was reading it. I don't know, has anybody read? Uh, did you note that? Yeah. He routinely, in his lists of their adulterers, their they're, they're fornicators, their thieves, their blasphemers, their Sabbath breakers, and it's like, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it was 1800s then. I, I thought. What's the name of the book? Uh, holiness. Holiness. Oh, it's actually not pursuit. I, I was mixing his up with. Um, I think uh, who was the guy that wrote Pursuit of Holiness? Who? Was it Tozer? That's a great book too. That's a great book. J C. The initials J C. John Charles maybe. A uh, Ryle. R Y L E has a great book, Thoughts for Young Men. And it's not just for young men, it's for all men, but a great book on godly manliness. So if you have boys, or even if you're not, if you're just, there are great thoughts on what it means to be a godly man. And, and obviously, we, we have a lot of need for that today. Uh, we're at chapter 11. A plan to repopulate Jerusalem is agreed upon. If, you know, you got to have people in the city. I mean, it was, and Nehemiah tells us in the beginning, it's torn down, the walls are broken down, the people are discouraged, nobody wanted to be there. It was a, it was a dumpy place to be. And so, you know, they, they get, you know, they, this, is, this is the center of, of, of their religion. The temple is there. And so they, um, they plan to, you know, once, the, once it's, it's built up to, to repopulate it. Um, chapter 12, a list of the returning temple servants, priests, and Levites is given. The wall is finally dedicated with a great ceremony and two large choirs. Accommodations were made for the support of the singers and gatekeepers. Chapter 13, finally there is a purification of ethnic religious syncretism in the people. While other reforms were going on, Nehemiah returns to Susa in fulfillment of his original promise. He told the king he would go for a while and come back. Later, he asked permission to return to Jerusalem because of more religious compromise. Interesting, you have to wonder if Ezra was still alive or not. I don't know. Um, might, be, might be well to assume that as he left and went back, Ezra was handling the the reforms and Ezra dies and things maybe get off the tracks again, so he comes back. You know, that's just all supposition, obviously. Later, he asks permission to return to Jerusalem because of more religious compromise. He institutes reforms pertaining to the Sabbath, again, and corrects the sin of intermarriage with uh, foreign women. There's, um, well, go, go to chapter 13, if you would, of Ezra. I'm sorry, Nehemiah. I've always kind of been taken by, um, uh, and this comes up earlier, but, but uh, let me just start reading in, uh, let me start reading in verse 10. Uh, chapter 13, verse 10. I also discovered that the portions of the Levites had not been given to them. He's talking about the problems that he's trying to fix. So that the Levites and the singers who performed the service had gone away, each to his own field. They had to survive, and they could, so they, they, weren't being, they weren't able to support their families. They had to go work. And so I reprimanded the officials and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? Then I gathered them together and restored them to their posts. All, of, all Judah then brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouse. And in charge of the storehouses, I appointed Shel Shelemiah, the priest, Zadok, the scribe, and uh, Pedaiah, 
of the Levites. In addition to them was Hannah, the son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, for they, considered, for they were considered reliable in their task to distribute to the kinsmen. And this is the part I want you to take note of, verse 14. Remember me for this, O my God, and do not blot out my loyal deeds, which I have performed for the house of my God in its service. And then he goes on in verse 15, and there's more things that, that they do wrong. And you get down to verse 22, and I commanded the Levites that they should purify themselves and come as gatekeepers to sanctify the Sabbath day. For this also remember me, O my God, and have compassion on me according to the greatness of that loving kindness. Um, and then verse 23, in those days I also saw that the Jews had married with women from Ashdod and Ammon and Moab. These were all foreign countries. As for their children, half spoke the language of Ashdod. None of them was able to speak the language of Judah, but the language of, of his own people. So I contended with them. This is a little bit bizarre. I cursed them. He doesn't mean he, he, he didn't use profanity. He cursed in the sense of you know, impre imprecation. Um, I cursed them and struck them and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God. <laughs> Uh, probably not a, not a small man. <laughs> you shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin regarding these things? Yet among the many nations there was no king like him, and he was loved by God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, the foreign women caused even him to sin. Uh, do we then hear about you that you have continued all this great evil by acting unfaithfully against our God and marrying foreign women? Even one of the sons of Yoda, the son of Yeshebub, the high priest, the son-in-law of Sambalat, the Horite, so I drove him away from me. Remember me, O oh my God, because, I, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the Levites. Uh, verse 30, thus I purified them from every, everything foreign and appointed duties for the priest, the Levites, even his task. And I arranged for the supply of wood at the appointed times and for the first fruits. And his closing words, remember me, O oh my God, for good. I mean, it's just, in this chapter 13, it comes up like four times. Um, comes up earlier in the book a couple of times. But, um, but, uh, but a, a, in a, kind of an amazing um, recurrence um, it, why, why? What do you think is going through his mind? Why? I think, I don't know, because uh, we listened or watched the Bible recap, whatever that thing is, of Esther and Nehemiah, Bible Talk. What's it called? Bible Talk? Bible Talk. Bible Talk. Oh, okay. Anyways, but at the end of each, like, effort of Zerubbabel, mm -hmm. Ezra, and Nehemiah, they all ended in, like, the people being, like, going away. And, like, yeah. Yeah, 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 and that's and that's there's a that's a good that's a that's a good point. There there isn't, you know, there is, there is there is there is movement forward. There are times under Haggai when they did what they should. There are times under Nehemiah where they they do what they should, but um, but it it doesn't stay. And we'll get to the time of Christ, and there'll be. You know, they'll, they'll be the ultimate act of rejection. So, yeah, yeah, um, we shouldn't read it as arrogance, we shouldn't read it as trying to grease his own skids with God. Um, I think we should. Um, we should probably read it as um, the thing that you would say when everybody around you is, when it seems like nobody is, like you're standing alone. And when you stand alone, you wonder if anybody knows that you're standing alone, <laughs> because it doesn't seem like anybody knows. Um, and, I, and I think that's the context in, in which he's just kind of stating God and he's not asking knows that God remembers, but it is, it is this, you know, it's, it's been a hard, it's been a hard road uh, to, to hoe. Uh, and, um, and, uh, and he's, he's doing it. The other, 
the other guy who, if anybody else w- could have could have could have written those words as as well as Nehemiah, would have been Jeremiah. You know, who when we get to him, you'll see again a very un. I don't want to say unfruitful, but um, but nobody ever paid any attention to Jeremiah. So, uh, okay, so that's it for the book of Nehemiah. Questions, comments, thoughts. Um, we don't have class for the next three weeks, I think, right? Three. And then we have it for one week, and we'll just start poetry books. And then we don't have it for two weeks. So, so really, until, until after New Year's Eve, until after New Year's, we've only got one more class somewhere in the middle of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of December. So... So keep that in mind, a, a nice break for everybody, and you can, you can uh, be, uh, be thinking about that. Uh, for the last couple minutes, and, and, and we'll, we'll cut out of here a little bit early, but, um, but if, does anybody have any qu- questions or comments or thoughts over the, we're, we're ending the historical section uh, of, of, our, of our Bible, and we're ending Old Testament history. We've gone from beginning to end. We started in Genesis, and we've ended, we've ended with Esther um, and, uh, and Nehemiah. So questions, thoughts, putting it all together, keeping it all straight. Um, anything on the, the history sections of, of the Bible? Can, can you all put a timeline down, you think, relatively accurately? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, Samantha. Um, well, I think, first of all, the, the, the purpose of the historical books is to, is to, to, show, is to give us a, a theological history. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's an accurate history, but it's a, maybe a, a theological perspective on history that we should see God working, God taking things somewhere. Uh, he hasn't gotten there yet. Um, he's, but, uh, but he is taking the world somewhere, very clearly, taking the nation of Israel somewhere, uh, and, um, and that, that there, is, and so history, history is a, you know, it's not like some people say, you know, history is always repeating itself, you know, that's, that's not a biblical view of history, biblical view of history is it's a line, it started, and it's going somewhere, and a matter of fact, the place that it's going is, we often call it, it's, 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 it's one of the words for, for end, it's the Greek word telos, but it means, it doesn't mean end, it's over, it means end, it's reached its completion, right? And, and God is, is bringing history to a completion. When he, when he brings history to a completion, when he brings it to its telos, then, then in a sense, you know, this, these whole, this whole area is, is, is done with, and and so we should we should see God walking walking along. That that should be a, a, an important thing for us, recognizing that that we are also in that um, in that in that uh, in that history. Matter of fact, um, how many of you are familiar with? He's he's not very popular because he's too theological. He's too good. Um, but uh, the uh, the the music singer uh, Steve Green. Not Steve. Yeah, Steve. It was because there was another Green. I forget. Keith Green was the one that was. But Steve Green is uh, is still alive, still singing. Uh, great, great, uh, uh, great singer. And um, and he and he and another guy, another guy who was actually kind of Kansas City born, born and raised. Can't remember his name though. Sings sings a song, and basically the theme of the song is that you know we're still in. I mean, they use the terminology. We're in the play. We're, you know, the final act hasn't been hap, hap, happened yet. We're still in the play, and we're still part of the, you know, for lack of a better term, the cast of of the play. History is still going on, um, and um, and God is still taking things somewhere. And and like we talked about with with Daniel in the end times, he's he's bringing it, he's bringing it to an end. So I think we should get that. 
Um, we should get that, um, we should see clearly the depravity of man through the nation of Israel. I mean, we are, we are to see from, from the beginning, from the fall of Adam, you know, we, we get it, we get it with the flood, you know, um, but even, even those who are given special privileges by God have a hard time not letting their depravity come through. And the grace of God, the grace of God is ever faithful, even though the, the, the work of men is ever so faithless. Um, and it's not an excuse to be faithless. And we've got lots of heroes along the way who, who, were, who were very faithful, okay, because of, their, because of their allegiance to and seriousness about the God of their fathers. Daniel's a great example um, of that, um, you know, what made Daniel so, so great. And so, um, so we don't have an excuse to be cold, lukewarm, lackadaisical, oh, well, nobody's going to do very well, so why should I try very hard, you know, type of a, of a mentality. Um, but uh, but giving it our best shot, we still are 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 reliant solely on on the grace of God. I think that's a that's a key issue. Um, I think the, the 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 flowing out to the to the Messiah, um, both the the prophetic realm of the Messiah. Um, you know the things that were that were as we get to the Messiah and as he comes on the scene. And, and we see all of the, the fulfilled prophecy in the Messiah uh, that should give us great confidence in the, in the veracity of the scripture that God has spoken to us in his word. This isn't just a book. It is a, it is a unique, unique gift of God that is, is reliable and, and faithful. I think, I think that should come out of, as we, as we study Old Testament history and, and those type of things. Those would be the top ones. I mean, not just off the top of my head, I mean, maybe not the top ones if I think about it long, I might say, boy, you dummy, why didn't you say this? This, is, this trumps them all. But, <laughs> but those would be the, on the top of my head. So any other thoughts, comments, questions? I think it's something interesting to, to mention um, about some of my friends from high school. They've actually moved into Israel. Um, mm -hmm. They felt, you know, when we're reading about repopulation, um, they felt as adults that they wanted to go back and be present Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what yeah. that looks like. Let me, um, and I, I I'm not sure why they do that. There's, there's a lot of weirdness with Israel. You know, maybe this is a good time. There's a lot of weird, and I'm not, I'm not saying that Anne's, but, um, um, but, um, um, you know, when, when I, I was, when I, that I, when I went to Israel, I went, I went with a trip. And I, when I went, I, I took my atlas. <laughs> That's the only, I took my atlas in my Bible. Because, because again, you're seeing the land, and I'd, I have a good atlas and some well, you know, oh yeah, this is where it, it was just where. but there was a group of people that were there that was more of the oh this is where Jesus walked. Can you feel it? I can. <laughs> <laughs> and it was more of that kind of mysticism. And I was in a group that had more mysticism than than than, than whatever, and, I, and I, I, I'm not at all insinuating your friends were thinking that, they just made me, made me think of, you know, some, sometimes different. people do, she, so she has, she has a, you know, yeah. a different, different perspective, a lot of Gentiles, you know, have kind of, you know, there's a, there's a whole movement out there, it's <laughs> called the Hebrew Roots Movement, where Gentiles want to, want to act and live like Jews, and it's kind of like, maybe that's another thing we should get from the Old Testament, matter of fact, it came up just the other day with somebody I was, Council, we, we tend to think that whatever was is, is Israeli culture is godly culture, and that's just not the case. You know, they, I mean, if you look at their history, <laughs> more, more, more wrong than good. So just because the Jews did it this way doesn't mean it's how things should be done. But there's an attitude out here because they were God's chosen people, and it's a special, special place to be that, that therefore they couldn't do any wrong. I'm not sure God would say that about them. Matter of fact, I'm reading in the book of, of uh, Jenny and I are reading through Ezekiel right now, and there's a couple chap chapters in Ezekiel where he talks about Ohala and Oho Ohalaba, and the two, two prostituting sisters, Syria or, or Judah and Israel, and one worse than the other, and just graphic imagery of the, 
wickedness. So, um, so, so, you know, so, so that's just, that's, that's rambling about um, cautions and concerns as you, as you study, you know, the scriptures in general and, and as you, you know, think about the nation of Israel in particular. So, um, but having said that, last final word on Israel. There are those that believe that because of their apostasy, God has gotten rid of them. He's done with them. Uh, matter of fact, a, a number of people believe that Israel is out, the church is in. And so whatever God promised to the Israelites now belongs to the church. And, um, and I think that's, that's false understanding the scripture. The scripture makes it very clear that God made promises to them in the context of history. He's going to fulfill those promises in the context of history. It'll be future history, but it's going to be history. And so um, for all of their weaknesses and all of their, and all of their wickedness, um, God will, will be faithful and will accomplish a work through them um, yet into the future. And you should be looking for that. So uh, let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for, uh, for history. And uh, there's a lot more in the scriptures than just the history. But, uh, but these, these portions certainly do help us to understand the, the flow of thought and uh, the flow of events that have taken place from creation at least to this point, up to the, to the, to the returning of your people to the land uh, where, where you once again gave them a, a second chance. Um, and uh, Father, um, there, will be, there will be highlights in the next couple hundred years with them and low lights. Um, and uh, and uh, ultimately, though, when you bring the Messiah to them, they will create the greatest or commit the greatest act of sacrilege and in, uh, in, in calling your son uh, Beelzebub. And so, Father, we, uh, we, we thank you for, for the opportunity to study these things, to learn from these things, to, to, to see your great grace, um, our great need of your grace, um, and, and the, uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, there is little, there's no hope for this world apart from the return of your son to set up kingdoms of righteousness. And so we, we look forward to that day and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.